Hey, we're, we're back. Uh, this time we're going to do something really different, like we haven't said that one before, but uh, both Curtis and I are sitting here. I mean, uh, last time we did that, I was interviewing you, mm -hmm. you know, like I had just met you or something, and then yep. he's done uh, two uh, drum video things showing uh, different parts that he's played throughout both albums, and did a little thing saying, hey, uh, we're not going to be available for a while. So, uh, you've seen Curtis on screen now for a while. Um, we're going to do something. This is the first time we, we're going to try to showcase, well, actually, it's an attempt, to showcase one of the songs from Trophy Hunting for Unicorns. And the song is called Please Don't Feed the Rhino. And rhino is spelled R-I-N-O. Some of you might know what that means. And it's as far as I'm going to take that one. But um, actually, we've been using these videos to showcase just little bits of the songs and just little licks here and there. And with John McCorkle, he played some chord progressions of something he's working on, but we did one of his tunes and we did Dan Lou's tune and then we had Greg Hogue. And we've just been showcasing bits and pieces of the album. And this is the first time um, we're gonna showcase an entire song. And it's practically the only one we can do. So it's this is, Curtis and I have both written this. I came up with most of the main licks, showed it to him, and what he did was actually make me play it correctly and um, <laughs> slowed me down. When I practice, I have a tendency to kind of play things a little too fast. And he, yeah. he put a lot, yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> he put a lot, of, uh, a lot of nuance into the different parts, and he gave it more dynamics than I was capable of giving it. So his writing style and his drums on, on here are just amazing. And like I said, the song is called Please Don't Feed the Rhino. And it, um, it's only two minutes and 39 seconds long. And I think we've spent more time on this than anything else. Our... Yeah, a lot of time for two minutes, that's for sure. Yeah, it's, it's just kind of ridiculous. It took us forever to get everything uh, everything really down and when we interviewed uh, Sean Browning he mentioned that uh, you can hear those parts where we talked about okay what are we going to do here yeah especially on that track I think he mentioned that um, you can kind of hear the way we communicate or work together when you're listening to it it's like you can hear two musicians really harmonizing and listening to each other um, to make something really rhythmically complex and bombastic and chaotic but obviously you know synchronized so and it, it yeah. took a lot of time to get that because I, I'd have to either slow my lick down or listen to how I was playing it yeah. and then listen to what he was doing and maybe do the lick a little bit differently in order to get it to work in the sequence. And mm -hmm. Anyway, it was a real learning curve and we don't know how many hours we have. Man, it's hard to tell. I do know, uh, I think again it was the summer of 2019 if I'm not mistaken. And we were just in my studio, uh, just consistently for hours and hours and hours, um, pounding out how this was going to work, you know, what sections will glue together and what transitions are going to be uh, synchronized and off and when we're going to come together. And <laughs> it, it was, yeah, it was a lot. It was pretty, it felt like a nonstop process, but uh, yeah, yeah. You want to talk about the studio well, process? Well, the phrase glue together is basically what we did in the studio when... When yeah, it came yep. time to record this at Tim Bichon's, uh, I kind of thought, well, in spite of all the time that we put into it, we're probably going to have a real workhorse of a moment here. And I, I thought we probably ought to just focus only on this song today. And we went in, booked an entire session just to do this because we thought it was going to give us a lot of trouble. Yeah. And it, it really didn't. Only because, yeah, I know it did. And we just, all those hours really, you know, we had it in the bag and, and it was pretty solid. We did, however, uh, figure out where to split the song in two and consider it essentially part one and part two. Um, whereas in the studio, we could rip through part one a number of times and get a good version of that and then start at our part two. Um, although John and I, every time it's played, we just rip through the entire thing together. As far as getting it on the record, we... <laughs> We split it into two and just like, all right, well, that's that's the better take of two. That's the better take of one, um, which is obviously a complete natural for a recording process. So it yeah. worked, it worked well. I think we spent maybe three hours tops in the studio. And that Probably. Was, that was going back and listening and listening to takes and, and talking with Tim and the setup and everything. And yeah. I, I went in kind of 
thinking, you know, this is really going to take a lot of time, and it didn't. Mm -hmm. So proof, practice, kids, practice. <laughs> and that's true. What's really cool is uh, we have a story about this song. We, this is uh, the first time it's ever been played. I, I can guess you say since this is a public forum, first time it's ever been played in public. Yeah. Oh yeah. It was the live debut. No doubt. No doubt. <laughs> we did, however, <laughs> Curtis and I. We we talked about this. Uh, we play in this three-piece classic rock and blues band called the Gary Gerard Group, and obviously Gary Gerard runs the band, and we've been playing together at least five years. Yeah. And we we play a lot of different bizarre gigs, and it's, like I said, classic rock and blues. We, play, we have played this gig. There's a gentleman by the name of Russ who lives around here, who is a biker, but he's he's not an outlaw biker. He's one of these guys who's into Ride for the Fallen, honoring Gold Star families, and and doing all those things that bikers use their presence and their their um, ability to, to gather people together to support the veterans. Well, Russ is very successful in what he does. He's, he's a uh, engineer of some sort, uh, mm -hmm. goes around the world and builds bridges or something. Anyhow, <laughs> he's got this really beautiful piece of property out in the middle of absolute nowhere yeah and he allows people to come camp and he has weekend parties he has a stage a a complete solid permanent stage with a roof over it outdoors which is bigger than some of the clubs we play in yeah easily Easily. It, it's bigger than this room. I mean, you could, you could get a horn band on this thing. Yeah, for sure. It has and, a couple of different tiers to it as well. And uh, not to interrupt, but a, a fun note about that stage is um, either side has the stripper poles, which is always... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which yeah. always green lights some less than holy activities. Yeah, well, you know, they're bikers. Uh, yeah, there's a the hot tub stage right. Yeah, and, <laughs> there is. <laughs> so pretty bizarre kind of party setup. Um, <laughs> you played yeah. there what twice with us now? Or um, this past time, this past what was it, summer or is it spring when we played there? Now that party, and that was the third time. Okay, so I played with you guys three three times there. Well, we venue. we played there like you said, spring. I think it was in May, and we were playing. And uh, like I said, he always has a, basically a party, and yeah. so we took our break, and he has a whole buffet of food laid out in another room. So we we took a long break. Yeah, and out. it's pretty loose, you know. He, he he pays us to do our normal set, but if we want to take a ten minute break or an hour break, he doesn't seem to care. Yeah, we can mingle with the uh, party goers. So by the time we started our second set, the sun had already gone down, and we were putting jackets and sweaters on and stuff. It was getting kind of cold. Yeah. So we started. We started the set in about what two or three songs into it. Yeah, it was it wasn't very far. All of a sudden, our front man, yeah, turns Gary, to us and he's like, "I want, I got to take a leak." Did I got to take a leak. And he said this in front of this whole crowd. It's like, well, there are a bunch of bikers. We they know us. We know them. Yeah. So he he leaves the stage and he as he's leaving, he says, he looks at us and says, "Do something." <laughs> yeah, just unprompted. You know, we're just. Me and John. So we're still... Yeah. Like, what? What, are, what, are, what are, Which, uh, you know, uh, ultimately, it, despite the fact we were a bit dumbfounded and like, oh, crap, what what now, you know? Uh, luckily, John and I have been playing forever and uh, think very similarly and, and, and write similarly. So I think we I think we had something to pull out. Well, I, so I just said, course. I don't know why. I said, okay, let's try Rhino. <laughs> yeah, so we did the live debut of Rhino and how'd it go? Well, about half of it. <laughs> <laughs> we got about halfway through and it just crashed. It just crashed and burned. Uh, it burned a, a miserable life. But death. fortunately, he was back at that time. But yeah. it was, we actually attempted to play this in front of people. And being a group of bikers, they didn't seem yeah. to care. Yeah, luckily, I'm, I'm sure they probably just thought it was a trash can fest and we were just being jerks, noodling with our instruments. Despite being dedicated to playing it, you know, counting it in and... Here goes nothing, jumping off the cliff. But well, There's nothing like a dedicated jerk, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. Yeah, for sure. So Anyhow. That this, was a live debut, for sure. This is uh, our video, and I guess technically live debut, of Please Don't Feed the Rhino. Yeah. And right now, we think that might be the only thing from the album we can actually do. We're, we're going to try to get a couple of the other guys in and maybe do some other stuff. 
Uh, yeah, for sure. That might be down the road. But yeah. right now, uh, sit back and enjoy. Yeah, for sure. Please don't feed the rhino. I would Thank say, uh, one, one last thing I would say is that I feel like this song is a part of a legacy, of course. Because on the first record, if you remember, we did Dave's Living Room, right? Yeah. And it's yeah. just bass and drums. So he comes up with these just wild, outlandish, and purely John DeGroff style uh, ba uh, bass, j you know, I, ca I call them jigs, but they're certainly, they're certainly more complicated than that, but... Um, this is the second, and I think we have a third one on deck to write, mm -hmm. but, uh, so we have Dave's Living Room and Rhino, and, yeah, they kind of serve as these, essentially, love letters to each other of our ability and our insane, uh, insane, uh, willingness to mesh, mesh our chaos. It's two musicians saying to each other, okay, here's this, what you, what can you do with it? Yeah, exactly, exactly, so, Yeah. Enjoy. Uh, other than call for you to have a psych evaluation, you know, we'll, we'll try to work on this. So, <laughs> yeah. So, hey, thank you. Yep. Thanks.